Hi, I'm Kristen, and this is the Simple Handmade Everyday Podcast, where I talk about living a creative, intentional life. I like to chat about quilting, sometimes knitting, what I'm reading and watching, and a little bit about keeping a cozy, organized home. I've got my cup of tea in hand, so let's settle in for a chat. This is episode 64. Welcome. Welcome. It is so great to be here today. What cozy drink do you have with you? Today, I am drinking Earl Grey. I realized at some point that I was missing my Earl Grey tea, and I haven't had some for a while, so I fired off an a Amazon order of Harney and Sons Earl Grey loose leaf tea, and I have made a couple times now uh, a London Fog. Do you know that drink? It's super fun. I mean, right now, I'm just drinking my straight up black Earl Grey tea, because It's the morning and I do intermittent fasting, so nothing with calories until lunchtime. But um, in the afternoon, it is delightful to have. So you brew a strong cup of Earl Grey tea and then you add um, steamed milk or foamed milk. Did I mention this on a previous podcast for Christmas? I bought my daughter who loves, uh, you know, the fancy coffee drinks a milk foamer. And I don't mean one of those things on a stick because we have had gazillions of those and they break and, you know, they're only like 10 bucks, but we've gone through so many of them. So a long time ago, someone mentioned how great, uh, you know, the type of milk frother that's in a pitcher is. I could be wrong, but I feel like they were super expensive, like $80. And I was just like, okay, that is never going to (laughs) rise to the level of something I'm willing to purchase to steam milk, but, or to foam milk. Um, but they, I don't know if they've come down, but for Christmas, we got her one, it's $40 and it is so amazing. I love this thing. Um, I'll put a link in the show notes for the brand, but you know, just milk foamer on Amazon. Um, and you know, what's funny about it is you just pour milk in, you press a button and voila, uh, a minute or two later, you have a beautiful, um, thing of steamed milk that's warm with a not like a lot of foam on the top. What's funny is that the mechanism that's on the bottom is that kind of round curly spring, which is exactly the same thing that foams milk with the stick um, foamers, you know, so it's the same action, but somehow it just does it so much better. You can swap the one we have, you can swap that out for what looks like more like a paddle if you just want to warm milk, like, I don't know, maybe better for a cafe au lait or to make hot chocolate, something like that. Um, but it is so cool. I keep saying to people, anyone who will listen, that <laughs> when Chloe moves out, someone's going to have to buy me one of these for a, for a gift because I cannot do without. Um, so between the milk foamer and my AeroPress, which makes espresso, I can do a latte. I can do the, um, I've done cafe au lait. I've done um, the London Fog. Okay, so you got the Earl Grey tea, the steamed milk, a little bit of vanilla, and then a little bit of sweetener. Honey, sugar, I used a little, I use a little stevia-based sweetener, and it is delicious. So um, maybe if I remember, I will link a recipe to um, that I followed pretty much for a London Fog, but that's all there really is to it. Wow, so that's way more about my tea than <laughs> I meant to talk about. How have you guys been doing? We have had some actual weather here in California, which is kind of rare for us. Um, We were having earlier this week crazy what we call Santa Ana winds, east winds, which are hot and dry, and they are wildfire winds. They cause wildfires because everything dries out. And um, luckily, we kind of got through without too many um, too many problems with the wildfires, but. They were so intense, and I just think this is a climate change thing because I've lived here my whole life. I've never encountered winds like this. There were gusts up to 80 miles an hour, and it was actually hard to work and concentrate because of the sound of the wind all day long. And then you'd hear, you know, these huge gusts, and you just—it just felt like the wind, the wind was going to take the the roof right off the house. And so it was just a very, like, sort of anxiety-provoking few days while we. Well, that happened. And then thankfully, we got just a little bit of rain, which is, you know, such a big deal where we live, um, which again, really helps with the wildfires when everything has dried out. And then we get some rain that can help things not, you know, burn to the ground. Um, But there's also crazy power outages around here. Um, My friend Minky lost power for, I don't know, like 36 hours over over a full day. I don't know why we, everyone around us, our neighborhood, this, that my son got sent home from school for the power outage, people across the, the way, um, we just really lucked out um, 
for not having any power outages. And then there was a scheduled power, power outage um, one night. This has been kind of common. We've had this a couple times now where they say that power is going to be out from 9 p.m. to 3 a.m. And before, I don't know how this works, this is for maintenance. They used to do this in the middle of the day, and I used to just like go to a coffee house to... Um, to work, you know, so I could have Wi-Fi. And I think that they did it during the day because a lot of people would be at work. And now they just can't do that because everyone works from home. So it was kind of interesting. But um, so we prepared for this um, by, uh, you know, a bunch of candles. So I last Christmas time, I made a bunch of homemade unscented soy candles. Um, I talked about that on a, on a podcast like a year ago, um, which is really fun. And so we have all these candles. And, you know, when you have to light a lot of candles, it's actually really nice to not have a bunch of competing scents. <laughs> um, so we lit a bunch of candles. And we played Scrabble by candlelight and phone light, to be honest with you, because it was nice to see the board a little bit better. Um, but one of my kids still needed to do homework. And so the um, that Halo Go... Um, rechargeable lamp that I got from Daylight that's been so instrumental for um, hand piecing. I can drag my hand piecing all over the house and even balance it on a chair arm and um, so I can always have the light I need when I'm sewing. This and it's but it's rechargeable so I made sure it was all charged up and he was able to take that up to his room and and finish up his homework so that was really nice but it was actually kind of nice it's really funny how when the power is out at night pretty much everybody just goes to bed early it reminds me of you know like the little house in the prairie times people went to bed early because they worked really hard but you know what do you do in the dark <laughs> so anyways that was kind of uh that was actually a little bit fun not so fun for people who were out of power for multiple days before we get going on the quilting segment, I'd like to thank the Fat Quarter Shop for sponsoring the podcast. The Fat Quarter Shop is a one-stop show for quilting fabrics and supplies for quilters around the world. They stock quilt shop quality fabrics, pre-cuts, quilt kits, patterns, notions, and even cross-stitch supplies. Join the Fat Quarter Shop and Moda Fabrics as they sew the Serendipity Quilt benefiting Make-A-Wish Central and South Texas. This organization grants the wishes of children with life-threatening medical conditions to enrich them with hope, strength, and joy. Serendipity is a row quilt of sampler blocks that simply fall into place. This beautiful quilt features Spring Brook by Corey Yoder for Moda Fabrics. We encourage you to donate just $5 for the use of each Serendipity pattern. Fat Quarter Shop and Moda will match up to $30,000 of the donations raised. You can also participate in the Serendipity Stitch Along. I'll put a link in the show notes. All right, let's talk sewing. What have you guys been working on? Once again, I don't have a lot to talk about here because I have been just hand sewing and hand sewing and hand sewing for the hand pieced quilts along, which will be revealed on January 25th. I will probably post this on January 24th. Um, so you might want to check over to the blog to see the quilt reveal. Um, we will, uh, the pattern will go on sale soon and the sew along, the quilt along will also happen soon. So there's still definitely a lot of time to get involved with this. But I have to say that I am so pleased with this quilt pattern and how these quilts are coming out. I'm actually still stitching mine. I have enough to photograph for the quilt reveal, but Patty has completely finished hers in true Patty style, quilted bound the works, and it is gorgeous. So definitely pop over there to uh, to see that and be sure to visit Patty's blog called Elm Street Quilts. Um, she posts fabulous content. She's an amazing quilt designer with like a gazillion quilts at quilt con this year that might be an exaggeration but she does have like multiples so anyways that's um you know I'm just enjoying the hand stitching I just have to say again that during this long winter this whole we're going on you know coming up on a year of the pandemic um, and all the craziness with politics and stuff sitting and hand stitching is you know just what the doctor ordered it is I'm just really really enjoying it. I will be sad when it's done, but I will stitch along with the quilt along. So I will get my, my hand stitching fixed that way. Not to mention that I have a number of projects that are waiting for me to get back to. So definitely check that out. Um, some other things that are going on, my friend Vicki over at My Creative Corner 3 is doing uh, an Irish chain quilt along um, based on my free pattern that's on my blog, which is an uneven Irish chain. 
and that's a it's it's there's a, a link and on my blog um, and it's a free pattern so definitely check that out people are sharing their their different quilts and it's so fun to see the same pattern in so many different types of fabrics and how creative people are there's a Christmas version there's solid versions it's it's really really cool I have to say that I am itching to get my sewing machine back out and make something besides masks which I'd like to talk about in a minute but um, a couple Christmases ago I got the quick curve ruler and I definitely want to make a quilt that uses that ruler so we'll have to, to see um, I've got some fabric set aside for that we'll, we'll see how that pans out but uh, I you know I've been hand sewing for so long now I am just really itching to just knock out a, a full quilt though I probably do need to make some more masks have you been seeing that the more contagious strain of the coronavirus um, is causing people to say that we need to upgrade our masks and uh, we do when I first made masks I made them four layers because it's somewhere I had heard that those are really hard to breathe through um, so all of the subsequent masks I've made have been two layers but now they are saying that um, that you should probably make them three or four and um, so I need to kind of think about that but if I'm going to do that I am so glad that I have discovered these uh, ear loops that I talked about on the last podcast and I know that some of you have purchased them through my Amazon link so thank you very much for that I appreciate it but oh my gosh um, I just cut the old elastics off of existing masks and sewed these on so they're not even tucked inside but they're so soft so they're the type they're uh, like a knitted tube they're like the the ear loops that are on you know the the surgical masks that you can just buy that are disposable and which by the way if you are wearing any of those disposable masks um i also read do not reuse those even that we because we don't wear them very long so we were reusing them if we happen to have one um, but you just those need to be thrown away they are not meant to be washed and used again and i know people are doing that but anyways back to the ear loops i'll put another link in the show notes but they are so wonderful they're the soft elastic and they come already with um, a little plastic tab that allows you to adjust them and so now basically every mask fits every person in our family and every time I put one on I kind of go oh these are so nice so it just really changes how I feel about wearing masks so um, definitely I just want to give another shout out to how great the I'm so glad that you know the technology has caught up with the fact that we are probably still going to be wearing masks for a while the sewing related book that I want to talk about today is called Boro and Sashiko Harmonious Imperfection The Art of Japanese Mending and Stitching. So um, I love this is you know it's hand stitching I love Boro I love Sashiko so this is I'm so glad to have this book in my library but let me talk about it a little bit. Um, this is uh, written by these two guys they're called the Shabu guys, I think. <laughs> Am I saying that right? Um, it is Shannon and Jason Mullet Bowlesby. So, if you don't know what Boro and Sashiko stitching are, Boro is like the Japanese art of repairing fabric um, through patches and layers and stitching. And there is a whole history at the beginning of this book to explain it with really cool photographs. And it's really about how um, in Japan, um, they just needed to to make do with what they had and so there can be layers and layers and layers of patches and then you need a some really strong stitching on top of that to really extend um, the, the life of different textiles whether they're clothes or other types of textiles so that's the boro side and then sashiko is the decorative stitching so they had a line in here that sashiko can exist without boro but boro cannot exist without sashiko because the sashiko are the stitches that hold all those layers together and they can be as simple as lines of running stitches and I've done this um, quite a lot especially on jeans where you get the like the thigh rub part and they kind of wear out and if I'm not ready to let those jeans go um, you can just um, put patches over those and then just stitch 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 um, and it's fun to do them you know two directions or under the diagonal things like that um, and it's just it's a really good way to patch holes in knees or, or you know different ways of repairing clothes um, 
And so this book is like everything you would ever need for that. So they talk, here's a section about the principles of Sasha Ko. They show all, a whole library of different stitches and how to create the, the grids for some of the more intricate patterns. Like I've mostly just done, um, like I said, the, the lines of running stitches. But if you take a piece of like plastic, um, that kind of grid that I imagine that people do needlepoint or cruel, um, you know, it's like eight o'clock, but it's plastic. So you can lay that down and then use a, um, like a chalk pencil to put a dot in each one of those squares and create yourself a grid. And then you can do um, this very even sort of very cool stitching on it. So it shows you exactly how to do all of that and, and the different stitches. And then there um, are a number of projects where you can practice this. Probably the most fun and easy one that would you could do is just a pillow where you just layer all kinds of um, fabric scraps on top of each other um, and then just do your your boro stitching or your sashiko stitching right on top of it it would be a really fun stash buster and um, and just to really practice those stitches would be really fun you know one time at a quilt show my very first quilt show in Long Beach I bought some pre-printed sashiko fabric it was like a whole kit it was like a yard of fabric and it came with the special um, sashiko white uh, I'm going to call it embroidery thread. You could also use pearl cotton, um, special wide eyed needles that are long. And um, I even have a certain uh, Sasha Co um, thimble, which cr puts this little round um, circle of metal. It's like a little ring you put on your middle finger. And so that on the palm of your hand, you can push that needle through because um, it's a big needle, so it needs some force. It's so, uh, and, and so it's a special kind of thimble for Sashiko. Um, but I've never known kind of what to do once I finish stitching this. What do I do with this? <laughs> um, because for, like, for true Sashiko, there is a pattern, and I can't think, it's like a 3-2 ratio, where I believe that the stitches are longer than the spaces between them, where, you know, if you're going to do like hand quilting or piecing, you try to keep those spaces even. And I believe with Sashiko, the stitches are longer and the spaces are smaller. Um, but it's a really fun kind of stitching to do, and I need to finish that panel and, I don't know, just cut it up and do something with it. Maybe make it into something crazy like an apron, because it's, it's really big. But here's some of the, the other... Um, projects there's a uh, two types of like sort of market bags one of those little toolkits that you can roll up to hold your um, your markers and and uh, needles and scissors a wall hanging a like a wrap um, you know almost like a shawl um, a throw two kinds of kimonos even so anyways this I'm so glad to have this book because I think I would like to move beyond just the um, the running stitch type of sashiko so anyways it's called Boro and sashiko harmonious imperfection all right, let's move on to books. I've actually got a few to talk about for a couple of reasons. One is I've been doing a lot of listening while I'm doing hand sewing, and I'm trying to stay off of social media, which means that I've just been doing also more reading in general. So that's been kind of fun. The first one I want to talk about is The Dutch House by Ann Patchett. I think I might have talked about it last time, but um, I finished it. So I wanted to discuss it a little bit. It was so good. Um, what's funny is as I was listening to it, I was like, at the beginning, I wasn't sure. I'm like, what is happening in this book? It's just like, what is the plot? It just seems like I've, you know, sort of been inserted into these people's lives. And why does this remind me of something? Well, it reminded me of this book that I listened to last year that I had the exact same feeling about, which is called Commonwealth. Turns out also by Ann Patchett. So, <laughs> so there you go. That's her style. I guess you, you love it or you don't. It turns out I love it. It took me a little while to get used to it though. So this book is narrated by Tom Hanks, who was delightful. Um, he actually had this really funny way of announcing the chapters. You know, most people, they just, you know, they're doing their reading and they'll just go chapter two, chapter three. And he'll, he'll go chapter two, <laughs> you know, like every chapter, he would say it a little different. It was kind of funny, but, um, yeah, it was just, it was an amazing book and I, um, been putting off listening to it for a while because I just wasn't sure if I was going to like it. But I really, I, I got into it and just would look for every opportunity to listen to it. So it is about um, a family, and it is told from the boy's point of view, that's Tom Hanks. 
And it's one of those, as I love, epic family dramas. It's told over um, a long period of time. And the way she goes back and forth in time is really cool. Kind of like This Is Us, how they do that whole time travel thing really well. So um, he is at the youngest four and at the oldest, you know, well into his like 50s. So it's his whole life and how it a lot of it revolves around where he grew up, which is this place called the Dutch House. And kind of like Rosamund Pilcher, where I feel like the house is a character in the story. The Dutch House is kind of like that as well. And it's called the Dutch House because it's this, this big mansion type of a house that was um, built in like in the 20s, I think, by this Dutch couple. And it's just kind of like over the top opulent and kind of out of place in the town where they live. And at some point, you know, that family dies off and this character, his name's Danny, his father buys this house. And um, so it's all about his how his Danny's life and how it unfolds with this house, things that happen with his his sister and um, his his dad and um, and how we all go into the future. I don't want to give too much away, but it's uh, just a really beautifully written book. And the way she uses language is quite kind of amazing. I actually, I'm, I'm not the kind of person that writes down quotes from books, and I'm going to not, probably not quote this exactly, but I did write this down because I thought it was so good. And the line was, she packed away all her disappointments in a box, but she carried that box with her wherever she went. And I just thought that was so perfect because I feel like we all know those kind of people who, who sort of pretend to put away their their gripes and disappointments about life, but in reality, they're still dragging them around wherever they go. And I just thought that was such an amazing way to put that. So The Dutch House by Ann Patchett. Um, obviously, the, the book I'm sure is really good, but the audiobook narrated by Tom Hanks was really amazing. Um, on a more frivolous, cozy, mystery kind of um, level, I don't know even know where I came across this book, but it's a free Kindle book. So if you have uh, Amazon Prime, um, you can get access to this. It's like the, I don't know, I don't have Kindle Unlimited, but there are certain free books on, um, on if you have Prime. And this is one of them. Actually, it's a series and the first three are all free. And this book is called The Secret Book and Scone Society. So Secret Book and Scone, I mean, how delightful of a title is that by Ellery Adams. And it's, um, light reading people, light reading, but it's just a fun, cozy mystery about this um, woman who owns a bookstore in a place called Miracle Springs in North Carolina. And it's one of those kind of places where people go um, to heal and to be rejuvenated. There's hot springs and, and things like that. She owns a bookstore and she does something that she calls bibliotherapy. So people come in because pretty much a lot, the, the tourist trade in that town is all about people who are trying to get over stuff and so she'll start she'll talk to somebody and you'll she'll find out that they are dealing with anxiety or going through a divorce or have a problem child or all kinds of um whatever issue their issue that they might have she goes around and she will select a stack of books that are designed to help them work through it. And it's a series, it's nonfiction books and they are often fiction books that kind of uh, where characters deal with that kind of stuff. And they're often books titles that I already know, which is just kind of fun to go, oh yeah, like that's kind of about, like, about that topic. And I mean, obviously people can also just buy whatever books they want, but this is kind of her specialty. And so anyways, um, there's a whole group of uh, women who become friends in this town. One owns a bakery and she makes something called comfort scones. So she will get a sense from somebody also of, of something they need to work through. And she will create a custom scone for them that have these ingredients where the smells will take them back to some part in their life um, that they need to revisit uh, to, to sort of heal. So anyway, so there's a lot of woo-woo in here, but it's really fun and there's always a death and there's always a murder and they they uh, work together to, to heal it. But it just sounds like, it's just really a delightful read. So that's The Secret Book and Scone Society by Ellery Adams. The second one is called The Whispered Word. I'm on the third one called The Book of Candlelight. I don't even know why these other ones are called these things, but, um, but it's this just super fun 
end of the day before you go to bed, light reading. And the other book that I'm listening to since I finished The Dutch House is called 24-6. And it's by Tiffany Schlein. And it is about taking what she calls a technological Sabbath or Shabbat. She's uh, Jewish. Just taking one day completely off of technology, off of screens. And um, in her family, she treats this uh, like Shabbat. So from Friday night till Saturday night, there are no screens. And she will admit that this takes some um, planning, like printing out directions to places you might go. Um, She actually, I think, had their landline reinstalled so that she wouldn't even have to use her phone as a phone. Uh, That's a step too far for me. I'm glad we don't have a landline anymore. But it's a very compelling book. It's a short read. Um, I'm I'm still listening to it. But, you know, the idea is just, you know, having that reset does a world of good. Even her teenage kids look forward to it. They kind of plan ahead for it. They um, usually invite somebody over for the Friday night Shabbat dinner. And she says when she wakes up in the morning on Saturday, it's just like, I've got a whole free day (laughs) ahead of me. And they do all the things that you kind of wish you did more of, Um, you know, just going out and, you know, hiking or playing board games, listening to music on an actual record player, um, things like that. And then, you know, by five o'clock on Saturday night, and then people are, um, especially the teenagers, they're back online. Um, And that five to five is kind of an interesting way to do that. So um, I'm kind of thinking about this, maybe not every week, but I would like to try it. Um, It does, it would definitely require planning because of how much we rely on that phone, you know. Um, So this kind of dovetails nicely with the fact that I've mentioned before that I have been um, really trying to get off of social media. And this started before Christmas where I decided to uninstall the Facebook and Instagram apps from my phone. And um, so I still can look at them from a desktop if I need to. Um, And I do do social media stuff for my job, but I will will check in um, to my, you know, personal page, which I'm not a poster really on my personal site. It's, it's, It's mostly about groups. And, you know, the Simple Handmade Everyday Group, which, by the way, um, I mentioned last podcast, you know, please feel free to post in that group. Share what you are making, cooking, what organizational challenges you have, reading, all those kinds of things. Feel free to to post your own content in that group, you know, as long as it's on the line of the stuff we we all are sharing here Um and people really stepped up and there was all kinds of posts and I was super happy to see that. So thank you and please keep that up. But anyways, um, I've really enjoyed being off of social media. And when I have checked in, um, even on Instagram, I've just been kind of like scrolling through going, you know what, I'm just not interested in this right now. And maybe it's because I'm not in the the space that I need to be inspired by quilts um, because I, I know what I need to be making right now. So I just don't need to be, I mean, I, I love looking at other people's quilts usually, but I think it's, you know, taking a break from it has been really good for me. So um, I am going to have to reinstall Instagram because we're starting the handpiece quilts along and I do want to share about that on Instagram. And I want to follow people who are sharing, you know, their handpiece quilts along quilts and things like that. But um, I want to f- really figure out a way to do it in a in a very thoughtful and controlled way and it may involve um, installing the app posting what I want to uninstalling it and then maybe three or four days later installing it again <laughs> because apparently I cannot be trusted to not engage on it um, if it's uh, if it's installed but I'm, I'm still kind of working that out I'm kind of guessing that nobody's missing me on social media right now and I'm sure I'll come back to it but um, it has just been really nice and it leaves more hours in the day to read um, and to do other things. Um, It's kind of amazing how much time you can really lose just by scrolling. Last weekend, I kind of realized um, I didn't want to watch anything. I had already done a lot of reading that day. I'm like, I don't know what to do with myself right now. I mean, I'd already been done a bunch of sewing. And um, so I'm just realizing that, you know, I can get back in the kitchen. I've gotten back into making kombucha and um, other fermented things, which I'll talk about in a bit. But it does just really, you know, I'm like, I could go outside and I could garden and I could do it without listening to something. (laughs) 
<laughs> and, you know, Chloe and I are working on our paint by numbers. There's like other things to do um, that I think we lose time for when we spend too much on social. So anyways, that is what where my brain is right now. And I'll let you know if I go ahead and do it. But this idea of the taking a completely unplugged day is very compelling to me. All right, let's move on to TV shows. Um, All Creatures Great and Small finally debuted on um, PBS. It's the new PBS masterpiece. And people, it is delightful. (laughs) It is absolutely the most feel-good show I've ever watched. I've actually finished it. It's seven episodes and, uh, you know, a lot of hand-piecing. What can I say? And, um, And I belong, I donate to PBS, so I'm on PBS Passport. So when these shows drop, you usually get access to the whole season, so I don't have to wait each week for them to come out. But it's, it wouldn't be the worst thing in the world to, to draw that out for seven weeks because it was so much fun. So this is... Um, based on the James Harriet semi-autobiographical book, All Creatures Great and Small. He is a vet from Scotland. He's out of vet college. He's looking for a job. He ends up taking a job in um, England. I have to just take a little side note here to say that I've checked, I've stopped recording twice to go back and check the show notes for the last podcast because I keep having deja vu that have I already talked about this? And I have not, but I realize that I have talked about that milk foamer. I worry about repeating myself. Anyways, back to James. He is a vet from Scotland. He goes to England. He gets a job. There's so many delightful people in here that you will recognize from other um, shows. One of them is if you watched Mr. Selfridge, um, there's a journalist character on that, and he plays the vet that uh, James goes to work for, and he becomes a country vet. It takes place, I actually just went and looked it up, in the 30s, and the costumes are amazing, the scenery is amazing, and it just has the most gentle (laughs) storylines. It's still very compelling, it's still, it's more about character than plot, but the plot is still really fun. And so anyways, if you have not watched this, it is just going to go down as one of my all-time favorite shows. I've never read the book, so I really didn't know what to expect, but that has been really fun. And the new masterpiece, Mystery, which I haven't, I've only started one episode, um, so I can't really give it any kind of endorsement, is called Miss Scarlet and the Duke. And this is about a female detective, I don't know, what's the time frame? It looks kind of like Victorian times. And um, I think she takes, it looks like she takes over her father's detective agency and she's running up, up against a lot of sexism, you know, a woman being a, a private detective and all that. But it looks very delightful. I'll probably talk more about that next podcast. So um, the other mystery show that I've been enjoying, and it's not anything new, but it's uh, the Miss Fisher's Mysteries. I tried one of those years ago, and for some reason, I just didn't enjoy the storyline, and so I never went back to it, but um, funnily enough, my dad loves them, so I was like, you know what? I need to check those out. My dad and I have this in common of loving the the mystery shows, Midsummer Murders and whatnot, Um, and I've really been enjoying that, so that's more like in the, I'm going to guess it's like the 20s or 30s based on how she's dressed. Um, So those are kind of the fun shows I've been watching. Just last night, um, we watched... Um, WandaVision. So we have Disney Plus. I got Disney Plus so we could watch The Mandalorian and we st- we had it for a month. It's already been canceled, but I, we have it for a few more days. And this is, a I don't know if you've seen it, but it's a show they're pushing um, really hard. And it was the weirdest show. It is somehow based on, in the Marvel Universe, apparently these two characters, which is like a robot and a, a woman who can make things levitate, um, were in the Marvel, like the Avengers movies. I haven't seen all those, so I don't really know, but um, they are a couple, and we only watched two episodes, but it was really weird because the first one was clearly kind of a takeoff on um, like a Dick Van Dyke show. The set was very much like the set on the Dick Van Dyke show, and the way they deliver their lines was like an old-fashioned sitcom, and then the second one was like a Bewitched episode, and... um, same very similar again set not quite right I was like why couldn't they have put the door in the right place like the stairs were in the right place and and the windows to the backyard I'm like that's so bewitched but they put the door in the wrong place anyways um it I I still don't really understand what they're trying to do with that show (laughs) 
but it was pretty, it was pretty weird. Um, yeah, so that's, that's about it for, um, the TV shows that we've been enjoying. So lastly, I wanted to talk about something that came up in the Simple Handmade Everyday Facebook group, private Facebook group, where someone was asking questions about how to organize recipes. And um, years ago now, oh my gosh, we're coming up on three years of this podcast. Um, But I talked about my system, but I thought I would uh, talk about it again. And we did cover it pretty well (laughs) in in the Facebook group. And people weighed in with all the different... um, types of ways that you can store recipes. But um, this particular person had, um, you know, stuff ripped out of magazines from years of doing that back when, you know, we all used to get the cooking magazines. And even now, um, when I come across something online, I print the recipe. Now, my husband and my daughter, who also cook, they don't. They just like bookmark it. Or I think Chloe keeps some pretty extensive Pinterest recipes, and then she will bring them up on her phone as she's cooking. I... Honestly, uh, you know, for I, I'm pretty technologically savvy, but I just cannot get into that. <laughs> well, first of all, it's not available to anybody else. So, you know, when Chloe is going to make something for, um, she cooks on su- on Sunday nights. If she hasn't written down what she needs when we shop in the morning, like, you know, I don't know where that recipe is online. But if you know it was printed out on cookbook stand, then I could do something. So, anyways, there's just something I really like about. Um, having a printed out recipe. I also don't like having my iPad in the kitchen where all the water is. So anyway, so this system is based on printing out recipes. So I've got them from, you know, printed out from the internet and from um, years of magazines and even cookbooks. I will photocopy a recipe from a cookbook, not always, but if we use it a lot, just so that it's, you know, in with the rest of the recipes. So what I do is I have actually two recipe binders that are separated um, by type with um, file with folders or dividers that have a pocket between them. And so what I do is for recipes that are tried and true that I've, you know, marked up and I put, I write like great or, you know, like who liked it, who didn't, any changes that I make, um, double, you know, or I have definitely have some that say like, you know, use the double amount of meat or use half the amount of this, you know, it's just the, the little adjustments that you want to make. And I put those in plastic sheet protectors. Um, in order to save space, I've actually, if they're smaller recipes, I've even just cut them out and glued them onto a sheet of paper so that there can be like four recipes on each side of the paper that's in the sheet protector. So those are tried and true. And I've got, um, you know, them separated by, you know, chicken, beef, fish, pasta, vegetarian, soups, um, crock pot, those kinds of um, things. And then I have a separate much less used binder that has breads, desserts, side dishes, rice, and then just kind of like miscellaneous things. So the the reason why I use the dividers that have the pockets is that when I find recipes that need that I would like to try, I put them in the pockets in front of each of these sections so that I'm, you know, when I sit down to menu plan, I do kind of try to go, okay, so let's have something, you know, we'll have something with beef, something with chicken, something with fish, something vegetarian, um, and then a main dish salad at some times of the year, main dish soup other times of the year. And that just kind of, I don't always follow that, but it gives me something to work from, a framework to hang it on. I know some people are just like, you know, um, meatless Monday, taco Tuesday. Um, we always have uh, pizza on Friday kind of a thing. Um, mine is more kind of like based on the protein. So so the way the system works is that, so as I'm going through and I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to pull out this recipe, you know, for, for our beef night, but I can, I can, I have a place to pull out new recipes to try them. And if they make the cut, then they get <laughs> pride of place with a sheet protector inside. Now, the, um, the flaw in my system is that um, I like to because this is, it's kind of an unwieldy binder at this point. What I do is I pull those recipes out um, that are in the sheet protector. And then I just put them, I have a cookbook holder. It's very nice on the counter. And I just have all the recipes clipped there that I'm going to use for the week. And the problem is, is that I'm terrible about refiling them. So then what happens is that I just shove them back into the back of the binder. (laughs) 
<laughs> and then that becomes the most often used recipe section. Um, but every once in a while, I will sit down and um, refile them and start to flip through the sections again and realize that there are tried and true recipes that I have not made for a year or more. So, so anyway, so that's how that um, system works for me. And I kind of use it in conjunction with another system. Um, I mean, that system is just about like flipping through the binder to be inspired for what to make. Here's the other system that I use. And I talked about this in one of my first podcasts and involves taking index cards and writing out an index card for each dinner. So it takes some investment of time at the beginning to sit down and really brainstorm out all the regular dinners you make. And then you I ha put them in like a little file box. And the idea is that you could just take out those cards and just deal out five or seven, however many dinners you want to plan for the week. Now, I've never really done that way <laughs> because, uh, yeah, I'm a little pickier than that. But I, it does give you this really easy way to flip through all your the things that you could make for dinner without flipping through a whole binder. And um, so that's been kind of a fun way to mix it up for dinner too. So, you know, you have to remember to keep adding it as you get new recipes and things like that. But it's just a fun way to get your rotation a little bit bigger. You know, I think they say that most people have like five to seven dinners and they just keep repeating them. And I know my rotation is bigger than that, but we still get sick of what we're eating. I'm so sick of what we're eating right now. <laughs> which is why I'm really glad that my husband completely cooks one night a week and Chloe completely cooks one night a week. So I only really have to plan on five and I still have not been able to work up the creative energy to do a new recipe once a week, which I used to do, but I'm sure I'll get back to that. So for now, it's tried and true um, recipes that, that just kind of keep us going. So anyways... Um, I'd love to hear more about how you store your recipes or, you know, how you handle that. I know on the thread in our Facebook group, a lot of people use Evernote or Dropbox and they can, when they're at the store, they can access recipes. But like I said, I just have not somehow been able to get into um, storing my recipes digitally. So I'm just going to close out with um, just a little update. I talked before about um, how I've gotten into brewing kombucha. And I'm tr really trying to get into these fermented foods, which are supposed to be really good for your gut, really good for your immune system. I took a break from brewing kombucha for a while because it is, it's kind of like another hobby <laughs> that you have to tend to every, uh, every week to 10 days. But, um, and the cool thing about kombucha is when you're sick of doing it, you just can just ignore it and it'll just sit there and continue to ferment. And when you are ready to take it up again, you just brew some fresh sweetened tea, throw it in there. And, and you're off to the races again. So that's what I did last week, brewed some tea. And um, so I'll be bottling some kombucha today, which I'm excited about because I've missed having it. It's really a, a really fun beverage to have, especially if you are, you know, trying to say drink less wine, things like that. Um, and I think, and my kids really enjoy it. But I've gone one step further on the fermenting thing, and I am now making sauerkraut, which between you and I, I don't love sauerkraut, but my husband does. And I've been trying to learn to like it because again, it's really good for you. And once I'm feeling really good about that, I'm gonna try fermenting some other vegetables. You can do fermented jalapenos, which we have pickled jalapenos before. We use a lot of canned or jarred jalapenos in our house. We like things spicy. Um, you can ferment carrots. You can do all kinds of things. So I'm gonna kind of dip my toe in that, but I've made two batches of sauerkraut now, which I will link to the video. I have found this YouTube channel and it's also a podcast called Farmhouse on Boone. And it's, she is like, has the life that I thought I wanted like 10 years ago. She has a little homestead. She's got a bunch of kids. She just makes all this amazing food. She's just, you know, like the ultimate homemaker, but not in, in any obnoxious way at all. I've been enjoying the YouTube channel, and um, so I've gotten into that. Uh, she has a, a, several videos on how to make sauerkraut, which let me just tell you how easy it actually is briefly. I didn't know, I mean, I assumed there was a brine that you would probably put like water and salt and that kind of a thing. That's not how it is for sauerkraut. You take cabbage, you... Um, can put it through a food processor. I've done it both ways. Um, I've decided we like it better, a little more roughly chopped, but you know, like you, as thin as you can chop it as a human, <laughs> as opposed to putting it through a food processor. You chop up a bunch of like, a, let's say like a, a large head of cabbage, and then you sprinkle about a tablespoon of salt on that. And then for the next eight to 10 minutes, 
you just scrunch with your hands that cabbage and salt. And then they actually make tools for this. I've also used a potato masher when my hands get tired and you just mash it. And that salt starts and the, and the actual pressure of squeezing the cabbage makes water come out of the cabbage. So you do this for about eight minutes or so till there's some water at the bottom. And then you just cram it into a, like I have a quart size wide mouth mason jar and you just cram it down in there tight enough that the the liquid raises above the level of the cabbage and then you take some extra cabbage leaves that you pulled off at the beginning and um, you put those large cabbage leaves on top and that's just to really um, seal out the uh, the air you know so that the, the oxidation can occur and then I just put um, like I do with kombucha I just put a dish towel over the top with a with a rubber band um, and you let it sit on the counter for like five days and then it's sauerkraut <laughs> it's like it's amazing and it takes about 15 minutes to make it's like it's so crazy um i've actually i'm gonna make some today um it, it this sounds a little bit gross but those cabbage leaves that are on the very top can get kind of yucky so what you can also do is still put the cabbage leaves down but you can buy these glass fermentation weights um, it's just a glass weight that goes and it holds anything that's below the level of the water, the liquid in there, um, is it's like it's safe. It will not mold or anything like that because of the, uh, you know, the whatever the chemical composition of that is. Um, it's, you know, because salt is used to preserve things. But anyways, um, if you're at all interested in making sauerkraut, I will link that in the show notes. And um, I don't know, it makes me feel like kind of fun that it's just a fun little thing to do to make the kombucha and make sauerkraut. And it's, um, I've had a little bit more time since I'm not, you know, scrolling, spend a little more time in the kitchen. All right. Um, there are no new reviews this week, um, but thank you for everyone who sent me wonderful you know, emails and direct messages. I appreciate all of you. Thank you for um, engaging in the Simple Handmade Everyday Facebook group, and you guys just have a wonderful week. You can find me online at my blog, Simple Handmade Every Day, on Instagram at Kristen Esser, and please consider joining the Simple Handmade Everyday Facebook group so that we can keep the conversation going.